Hitting the dyno for the first time with any project build is always exciting. You finally get to see the results of all of your hard work and just as importantly, all the dollars you've poured into the build. But how do you approach the tuning step with a freshly installed ECU with a blank map and no numbers at all? Well, in this video, I'm going to show you how we deal with this exact situation. I'm Andre from the High Performance Academy and welcome to part four of our Project Panhard build series where we're documenting the planning, wiring, configuration and tuning of a V8 swapped Toyota 86. At the end of our last video, we'd completed the wiring harness and we're ready to configure the ECU before firing up our engine for the first time. When faced with an installation like this, there's a lot of work to do and to a novice tuner, it seems like a massive job that can be really daunting. Based on many years of tuning cars and training other tuners, I've developed the HPA 10-step process for approaching any tuning job, and that's what you'll learn in this video. This 10-step process breaks the tuning job down into smaller, bite-sized pieces that are each quite manageable, and this means that they can be dealt with easily and quickly. By the end of the process, we end up with a completely tuned engine that will produce good power and torque while offering great drivability, good fuel economy, and great reliability. More importantly though, following this procedure will make sure that you don't overlook any critical steps. This is an easy thing to do, and it can waste time, money, and potentially result in expensive engine damage. Once the wiring's finished, there's always the temptation to hit the dyno immediately to get that instant gratification for all our hard work. The job, though, actually starts well before we get anywhere near the dyno. Our first step involves configuring the ECU to suit the engine. In order to run the engine correctly, the ECU needs to know what data it's expecting to see from the engine speed and engine position sensors. This data makes up what is usually referred to as the trigger mode, or in the MoTeC M1 ECU we're using, the ref sync mode. There are about as many different trigger modes out there as there are engines, and the first hurdle for us was that MoTeC didn't have a mode for the 1UZFE VVTI engine. One of the first jobs we had to do, therefore, was to capture some data from these input sensors that we could send to MoTeC so they could add an appropriate ref sync mode for us. Along with the ref sync mode, we also needed to tell the ECU how many cylinders the engine has and what the firing order is for the engine. While we were waiting for MoTeC to write the trigger mode for our 1UZFE engine, we could move on to the second step in the process, which is configuring and testing the inputs and outputs to the ECU. This includes setting up parameters such as our pressure sensors, temp sensors, and our drive-by-wire throttle body. As well as this, we also needed to configure outputs like our radiator fans and cam control solenoids. Now this doesn't sound too exciting, but it's an essential part of the process as it ensures everything's working properly before we hit the rollers. The third step in our process involves configuring the fuel and ignition systems, which involves telling the ECU what injectors and ignition coils it's controlling. The VE fuel model in the MoTeC M1 requires us to enter all the characteristics for the pump fuel we're running, and also we need to tell the ECU about the injector's characteristics. This is the injector data we got from MoTeC at the start of the project, and with this data, the ECU knows exactly how much fuel is going to be delivered for a given pulse width. We're getting close to being able to start this engine, but before we do this, we need to set up the volumetric efficiency and ignition tables. Now we don't need to be too worried about having these numbers exact right now, as we'll be easily able to dial these in quickly once the engine started for the first time. For the ignition table, we just want to start with some conservative numbers that will allow us to get the engine running before we can optimise them on the dyno. Now this is one area that I know a lot of budding tuners struggle with, as they think you need the exact numbers in these tables or the engine will never start. As you'll see, this just isn't true. 
Our final step before we can turn the key and step five in the process is to set the base fuel pressure and ignition timing. In this case, the fuel pressure in the 86 is fixed, so we have nothing to do here. Setting the base ignition timing means aligning the timing with what the laptop's displaying, so the actual ignition timing we're seeing with the timing light is the same. This is a critical step in the process, and I've seen engines damaged in the past because this wasn't done correctly. At this point, we can finally start the engine, and here, all that hard work pay off. This is always an exciting time in any project, and it's very rewarding when it all works out. During the initial startup, we can make some course changes to the fuel table to make sure the air fuel ratio is on target, and we can make sure the engine is mechanically sound with no leaks or nasty noises to cause concern. Before getting onto the dyno, we have one last step, which is to dial in the idle control and make sure we can achieve a good, stable idle. Again, this doesn't sound too exciting, but often we can end up seeing mechanical issues or wiring problems show up here at idle, and fixing them now will prevent expensive dyno time being wasted later on. Now that we have the engine idling happily, and we're confident all the engine systems are working as we'd expect, we can hit the dyno. So let's jump in and take a look at the tuning process. So we've got the 86 strapped down on our mainline chassis dyno and the next step in our tuning process is to optimise the fuel and ignition tables in steady state. Now what that means is we're using the dyno to apply a variable amount of load to the engine and that's going to help control the engine RPM or more accurately the rear wheel speed and keep it consistent. Now that's going to let us move nice and easily through all of our tables and really accurately tune all of the zones. To give you an idea of what that looks like, let's have a look now at the fuel table or the volumetric efficiency table in the Motec M1. And this is a table that tells the ECU how much air is entering the engine. And you can see at the moment we're operating in this particular site here which is at 2000 RPM and 40 kPa. Now the dyno is controlling the engine RPM to keep that consistent. So as I move my foot up and down on the throttle I can move through this table and accurately control which site we're accessing. So the process is to tune the number in the efficiency table until our measured air fuel ratio matches whatever target we have. Now we can see those numbers here. We have our fuel mixture aim or our target aim mixture which is 1.0 lambda and at this particular point you can see that we have our measured air fuel ratio from both banks of the engine and those are sitting at around about 0.92 lambda. That means we're a little bit richer than we are targeting which means there's too much fuel going into the engine. Now I can correct that simply by reducing the number in the volumetric efficiency table and you can see that as I do that our air fuel ratio moves closer to our target. So the process is simply a case of moving through the volumetric efficiency table and making changes to the numbers in that table until our measured air fuel ratio matches our target at each point. Now that covers the fuel side of things. Once we've done that, we also need to optimise the ignition timing. And when we're doing that, we're using the torque feedback from the dyno to tell us when the ignition timing is optimal at every point. Now this process fills out our three dimensional tables of fuel and ignition numbers and what that means is that when we're driving the car out on the road or the racetrack it doesn't matter what combination of engine RPM and throttle position we're using, we're going to know that the air fuel ratio is correct and we're going to know that the engine's tuned with the correct ignition timing that's going to give us the most amount of power and torque as well as good fuel economy. It's going to give us a car that's going to drive smoothly feel very responsive to the throttle and deliver really good power and torque along with good reliability. However, this process is only part of the tuning job. 
once we've done the steady state tuning, we need to move on to the wide open throttle ramp runs. Now this is the more exciting side of dyno tuning and this is probably what you've seen if you've ever taken your car to a tuner and had it run up on a dyno. So let's take a look and see what that looks like. So there's a quick example of a ramp run and this is how we tune the wide open throttle areas of the fuel and ignition maps once we've done that steady state tuning. And we're using the dyno to simulate how the engine will be used on the road or race track. We, we're simulating the kind of acceleration we'd see when we're out on the track. And what we're doing is looking at the power and torque results that we get during one of these ramp runs and at the same time we're logging data into the ECU, data such as our air fuel ratio, such as our knock values and we can use that feedback to decide what changes we need to make to the fuel or ignition timing maps. So this is the process we use when we're tuning the car. Using the feedback from both our dyno and our ECU logging, it's really quick and easy for us to optimise both the fuel delivery and the ignition timing, making sure that we're getting the most power and torque out of our engine while making sure we're also retaining reliability. The final step in HPA's 10 step tuning process is to confirm everything we just saw on the dyno out on the road. The dyno is the perfect place to be optimising our power, but we don't drive or race our cars on a dyno. So what's really important is that everything we saw on the dyno matches in the real world. So what we do is we take the car out on the road or a racetrack and we use the onboard data logging in the ECU to make sure that our air fuel ratio matches what we saw on the dyno and we'll also be listening for knock or detonation to ensure that our ignition timing is safe out on the road. So that brings us to the end of our tuning session with Project Panhard. The final dyno results were 178 kilowatts at the rear wheels, or if you work in horsepower, that's 238. Now, I know a lot of you out there will be thinking to yourself, that's not a lot of power. But the owner of the car knew exactly what he was getting into when he chose the 1UZFE V8. He didn't want to go down the turbo route, he wanted a V8, and he's also brand loyal, so he was never going to fit an LS V8 into this car. The other thing to consider with the drifting that the owner's doing with this car, if the worst does happen and he ever damages an engine, these 1U ZFE engines are really cheap here in New Zealand and can be picked up for as little as a thousand New Zealand dollars. That makes it really cost effective if something does go wrong down the track. So there's only one thing left to do now and that's hand the keys back to the owner so he can take it out and start enjoying it on the racetrack which is why he built it. We're sure to be able to bring you some video later on of this car in action so you can see what it's all about. Uh, if you've enjoyed this series and perhaps you'd like to learn a little bit more about EFI tuning we've got the perfect opportunity for you. Somewhere around here you'll see a link. You can click on that link enter your email address and we're going to send you a completely free series of tuning lessons that are going to teach you about some of the fundamentals of EFI tuning. And regardless if you're just interested in cars or maybe you're considering a career as an EFI tuner, we consider these lessons to be the bare minimum level of knowledge that you should have. Alright that brings us to the end, thanks for watching, we hope you've enjoyed it and we're bound to be back in the future with another build for your viewing pleasure. This uh, HPA sticker though, we've made some bad choices. We're not sign writers, we're tuners. We should have left it to the professionals. <laughs>